Steel had stood on the side of the Royal Road headed south out of Copenhagen on the second day of June in 1597. You would have witnessed a scene that was as tragic as it was unimaginable. On that day, a procession of sorts departed the city headed south for Rostock. The caravan, made of carts and carriages, carried with it the treasure of a lifetime, though only a small portion of it was in the form one would usually find it. Instead, there were 3,000 books, among the largest collections in Europe at the time, with nearly every book written about astronomy being a part of the corpus, including what may have been the last remaining copy of Copernicus's Commentariolus. Additionally, there was a globe that marked the position of some 1,000 stars on the celestial sphere to a never-before-achieved precision. Other carts carried scientific instruments, the finest in all of Europe, so finely crafted that they could measure the angle between two trees three feet apart at a distance of just over five miles. With the carts were the carriages that carried an extended household, servants, assistants, a wife, and six children. Presiding over all of this was the pot of Familius himself, the astronomer, mathematician, court astrologer, aristocrat, and now exile. For two decades, his personal star had burned brighter than the one that had first brought his prodigious intellect to prominence, but no longer. He had suffered setbacks and tragedy. His name had been besmirched. He had stood up to a boy king, and he had lost. Many of his friends were now dead or discredited, victims of the religious fundamentalism beginning to royal Europe. No longer was the virtue of Amicitia held to be the pinnacle of the learned man. No longer were kings beholden to the aristocrats who had long guarded their border. The world was changing, growing colder, more rigid, more religiously dogmatic and politically autocratic. As Tycho Brahe left Copenhagen, never again to return, he was likely as stunned to be leaving as nearly everyone who knew him. For as long as anyone could remember, he had been a fixture of the Danish court, whose books and horoscopes had brought fame and honor to the kingdom and the crown. But maybe it had all gone to his head. Maybe he had forgotten who he was and the boundaries he had pushed and stretched. Maybe he had forgotten that the patronage he took for granted came with obligations, obligations he had neglected. The fall had been swifter and more complete than anyone, most of all Tycho himself, had imagined. But maybe it was for the best. He had always hated the life of a courtier. Even as he had mastered it, he despised it. It was a dirty work, full of vanity and lies and intrigue. He'd had his fill of it all, and so had set out to find a place where he could once again pursue his muse, the blessed Urania, with no interference, and thus redeem his name. Hello, and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. <laughs> Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 3, Finding Our Place. Episode 15.3, Supplemental. The Decline and Fall of Tycho Brahe. As we finish up our three-part series on the life and work of Tycho Brahe, let me preface what's going to happen with a few introductory remarks. First, I wanted to follow up on something I talked about in the last week's episode that deserves a bit more commentary. I've mentioned some estimates of Tycho's ability to measure the positions of things in the heavens both accurately and precisely, and I, I feel that I should follow up on that a bit. 
to begin with, let me distinguish between those two ideas in an experimental or observational sense. Accuracy is the ability to get the right number, while precision can be thought of as an ability to repeat a measurement within a certain range. The classic way to imagine the difference between the two is to think of a bullseye target that someone is shooting arrows at. Accuracy is being able to hit the center of the target, while precision is being able to get a tight grouping. File that away, as we'll come back to it in here in just a moment. Prior to Tycho, no one in astronomy had really thought about these things as being separate. Most of the time, they sort of assumed that whatever the smallest reading they could get with their instrument was both the limit of their accuracy and their precision. A few, like Copernicus, understood that environmental factors could come into play, such as trying to take an observation on a windy day, but things were oftentimes pretty slipshod when it came to these sort of ideas. This was one of the things that really had aggravated the young Tycho, and it pushed him during his days at the various universities to study astronomy as something that he could make more scientific. One of the things that Tycho realized was, was that if you take several observations, and they're all over the place, you really don't know much about where things are really at. And that was the state of astronomy. Every astronomer had measured something, and if you put, tried to put all their, their observations together, they were scattered all over the place. Another way to say this is to say that accuracy without precision is meaningless. To go back to our target analogy, if our archer fires several arrows, and they end up spread out all over the target, he's not very precise, and so we don't actually know how accurate he is. Sure, the average of his arrow locations may be near the center of the bullseye, but you aren't going to have a whole lot of confidence about where the next shot is going to end up. On the other hand, if the archer shoots a bunch of arrows and they all hit the target pretty much one foot to the left, there are two things that you can say. One is that you, you can be pretty sure that the next arrow, if fired under the same conditions, will hit pretty close to one foot to the left of the bullseye. The other is that if the archer can make an adjustment to his process, maybe by adjusting his sight or something of that sort, so that he hits the center of the target the next time, you can be confident he'll do it over and over and over. What Tycho realizes is that precision is just as important, if not more so, than accuracy. This recognition is going to be the fundamental underlying thing that drives all of the observational work he does. He's obsessive about it. He's going to take multiple measurements of things with multiple instruments and eventually at multiple independent sites. He's going to be constantly improving his instruments and working to correct for error by inventing new sites and new scales for those instruments. He brings in the best craftsmen he can get to work at the observatory and in time, Uranobor gains a reputation as a destination for those craftsmen who wish to work in a highly innovative and technical environment. The techniques developed there would eventually filter out into the world and be used to construct navigational instruments for ocean voyages and land surveying. So how precise was he? Well, he claimed that he was able to measure things with a one arc minute precision. Kepler, the guy who would become his assistant down the road, would later write that his precision was closer to four arc minutes. And this will actually be a very, very important point for our story down the road. And so I wanted to get a bit more into that information. One of the things I wondered was if modern historians of science had ever tried to replicate Tycho's instruments and methods to see what could be learned. In my quest to find the answer to this question, I contacted the author of the excellent Renaissance Mathematicus blog, Dr. Tony Christie, to see if he knew of anything that had been done in the past. He wrote me back saying that he didn't know of anything, but that he would ask around on some of the forums that he was a part of. From his inquiries came a flood of responses that were extremely helpful. So before I go into those, let me thank Professor Christie for his help, and also state that if I make any mistakes going forward, those are completely mine, I'm certain. Professor Christie is not responsible for those, nor are the authors who provided information in response to his queries. What I learned falls into about four categories. First, one of the hardest things about this whole project of Tycho's was his ability to keep time. Being able to determine the motions of the planets depends in large part on being able to figure out how far they move through the sky 
which in turn means determining at what time they cross the meridian line due south of his observing location. The best clocks of his time, or his day, I should say, kept time to an accuracy of maybe, maybe five minutes. An arc minute of angular motion through the sky takes about four seconds of time. Therefore, he has to work very, very hard to develop the most accurate clocks in the world in order to be able to make the observations that were necessary, and it was an ongoing project of his to do so. The second thing is that he has to establish the latitude location of his observatory with higher precision than the precision he's trying to achieve when he makes his measurements. From what I found, it seems pretty reasonable to conclude that he was able to measure the altitude of the North Star, Polaris, from his location on Venn to a precision of under 30 seconds of arc. The third thing was probably the most delightful part of the whole set of inquiries that I, I got back. One of the responses to Dr. Christie's query on my behalf came from Dr. Owen Gingrich, historian of astronomy. Dr. Gingrich shed some light on why Kepler reported a bigger figure for Tycho's precision than Tycho himself did, and then on, went on to say that during the Mars opposition measurements of 1585, Tycho used three bright stars to measure the angles to Mars in order to establish the planet's position each evening after sunset and again in the morning before sunrise. These were the stars Arcturus, Spica, and Caudalionis. Gingrich said that he repeated this method using two stars in pairs for a total of three sets of observations, and found that he was able to get positions under an arc minute, thus lending credence to Tycho's claim. I don't know about you, but I think it's th that getting a response from the world's leading expert on Copernicus to my question was pretty darn cool. Finally, while Tycho's instruments were able to measure the positions of stars with extremely high precision, there were probably other factors that would have made his measurements less precise. We know that one of the reasons that he built that second observing site, and he built it so that it was partially underground, was that he had to find a way to reduce the buffeting of the wind, something that affected the measurements being made in the original observatory at Uraniborg. Another factor that he had to deal with was that as his instruments got larger, something that would allow for more precise measurements, the weight of the wood and metal that made them up would flex and bend them ever so slightly. It wasn't very much, probably too small to be noticeable by the human eye, but when measuring such tiny angles, it became an issue. One of the things Tycho didn't have at his disposal was what we would think of as the modern methods of statistical analysis and determination to allow him to characterize what we would call his random uncertainty. While it is beyond the scope of this particular episode to go into things like standard deviation and where they come from, recent analysis of Tycho's data using these kinds of tools show that while his instruments did have a precision of less than an arc minute on an individual measurement, the various random factors created an uncertainty of around two to two and a half arc minutes, more than Tycho claimed, but less than Kepler thought. Copernicus, much earlier, of course, had written that if he could get his measurements to be accurate within 10 arc minutes, he could revolutionize astronomy. Tycho was able to beat that by a factor of five. And while Tycho himself wouldn't create the revolution, Kepler would using the data that Tycho had gathered. The second thing I'd like to talk about is that there's really a lot of inaccurate information out there about Tycho as a person. I know that as I learned the stories about the Copernican Revolution as a high school nerd and then a college physics major, he was portrayed as this really awful guy. It's like he was some sort of a foil for the stern and pious, serious figure of Johannes Kepler who was a right proper scientist. In this way, Tycho's had all of these negative stereotypes attached to him, especially, I think, by Victorian-era writers who, thought, who sought to portray him as some sort of drunken and debauched buffoon who squandered away a lifetime pursuing these sort of backwards ideas that had been left behind by the more gifted Copernicans such as Kepler. This is really, really unfortunate. While Brahe did have his flaws, and we'll certainly explore them in this episode, those flaws were as much a result of being born in a time of great change and turmoil as they were of character. This isn't to say that Tycho was some sort of martyred saint, but rather that he was a man of his time when the times were a-changing. His worst character trait, his jealousy and paranoia, 
could be said to be the result of not some inherent lack of trust, at least initially, but instead the result of a series of events that shattered his ability to believe in his fellow human being. A wound made even deeper, given his desire to achieve relationships steeped in that virtue, amicitia. So this is where we'll start. We'll start at that first crack in his, up to this point, well-ordered worldview. The years between 1582 and 1592 are sometimes referred to as Tycho's quote-unquote golden decade. It's during this time that everything on Haven is running on all cylinders, at least from a scientific perspective. Tycho's family is with him, the instruments are coming together, and the data is beginning to really pour in. Tycho's measurements on the comet of 1577 have been fully analyzed, and he's beginning to see that the millennia-long picture of the heavens is deeply, deeply flawed. The path he's calculated for the comet makes it pretty clear that there are no spheres, crystalline or otherwise. More than this, though, his inability to observe stellar parallax, that shift of stars he thought he'd be able to see if the Earth did in fact go around the Sun, was beginning to suggest to him that while Copernicus's work was truly remarkable, especially in its rejection of Ptolemy's equant, it might also just be flat out wrong. These two things begin to get him thinking about other models that might be right. He probably knew about the ancient model that had put Mercury and Venus in orbit around the Sun as a way to explain the maximum elongation observations we've discussed in previous episodes, and so that may have been a starting point for him. As we said in our last show, he had held off publishing his book on his comet observations because he really wanted it to rise above all the other works that had been rushed into publication shortly afterwards. By 1583, he hit upon the way to do that, and it was in the creation of his Tychonic model, which we've discussed earlier as well. The evidence suggests that he may have been toying with the idea much earlier than this, and that may have been one of the reasons he undertook that Mars Parallax project. While the 1582-83 opposition observations did not resolve the issue of whether Mars came closer to the Earth than the Sun due to problems in characterizing atmospheric parallax, the model and many of the details did fall into place during that period of time. In 1584, he received a visit from his kinsman by marriage and good friend, Eric Lang. Now, Lang would have been counted among those with whom Tycho would have shared that Emicatea relationship and so the visit would have centered around the learned activities of the observatory. Additionally, Lang was also an aristocrat who governed a castle for the Danish crown, and thus he would have traveled with a sizable retinue. Now, one evening during the visit, Tycho sketched out his idea for the model on a large green tablecloth for Lang as part of a conversation they were having. And this is important because it establishes very clearly that as early as this 1584 date, Tycho had the model pretty well worked out. Now Tycho still hadn't nailed down the last of the details, and so that was probably the reason for the discussion. He was likely engaging Lang in some sort of collegial conversation as a way of working through some of the possibilities in terms of solving the last few problems that the model had. One of Lang's party was a man by the name of Nicholas Reimers Baer, and Baer was a surveyor with a gift for mathematics. Tycho had been considering Baer for the position as an assistant at the observatory, and so because of this the two had engaged in some correspondence over the matter and thus were not unknown to each other. Now as the visit began, Tycho and the household noted that Baer was odd, he acted secretively. On one occasion, Baer slipped away from the main room and had gone into Tycho's library and was leafing through the manuscripts Tycho had been working on. At other times, he examined and made rough sketches of the observing instruments, something that was, you know, not technically wrong, but was kind of a faux pas, if you know what I mean. Now, things first came to a head when one of Tycho's assistants, Anders Vyborg, really took notice of the behavior and began baiting Bear and used a bunch of arguments designed to kind of raise Bear's ire, to poke fun at him a little bit. 
While Tycho played it off as a joke, even he could see that there was something amiss by the sort of overreaction Bear sort of displayed in all of this. In fact, it was so bad that he insisted that when he and Lang discussed that new model, Tycho had Bear leave the room and then erase that tablecloth when he was finished. And the reason he did this is he was worried that Bear might actually be snooping around trying to steal ideas. Soon after this, Viborg snuck into Bear's room while the other man slept and went through the pockets of his clothes. What he found were a large number of writings and tracings of Tycho's work, some of which he took with him as evidence of Bear's foul play. When Bear discovered this, he launched into hysteronics, quote, shrieking, weeping, and screaming so that he could hardly be calmed down, end quote. The situation was smoothed over by treating the episode as a sort of poorly conceived prank or practical joke, but now Tycho was truly worried that it had a spy and a thief in its midst. Now it's unclear as to whether Bear was kicked off the island or allowed to stay out the rest of the visit, but the next time he surfaces, it's in 1586 in the court of Landgrave Wilhelm IV of Hesse. Wilhelm and Tycho were close friends doing the land, due to the Landgrave's love of astronomy and their shared status as, a, as aristocrats. In a letter from his friend, Tycho learned that Bear was purporting to have invented a new model of the solar system, one that impressed Wilhelm greatly. Of course, Wilhelm had no idea that the idea was, in fact, the one Tycho had shown Eric Lang two years earlier. Due to a certain vagueness in Wilhelm's report, it seems that neither did Tycho. He did, however, have his suspicions, and now his data from the 1585 Mars opposition event seemed to clearly show that Mars had to circle the sun, and so it was important for him to get his model out as quickly as he could so that he could claim priority. These two things spurred him to finally publish that book on the comet in 1587, and one of the things that's interesting about the book is it contains in it a critical review of all of the other literature on the comet up to that time. So useful was this edition that it would become a standard part of most subsequent scientific communication. What's also interesting about the book, though, is that Tycho makes no mention of his Mars op observations. And we just don't know why. Maybe he wasn't satisfied with them yet, they somehow didn't reach his standard of, of precision or accuracy, or maybe he wanted another round of observations to confirm them, but whatever the reason, he did in fact leave them out. The upshot of all of this was that the two men would fight a long, bitter, running battle over who could claim the right of priority for coming up with this Tychonic model idea. Tycho didn't really have hard evidence that Bear stole the idea but if it came up in a court of law, he sure would have had a ton of circumstantial evidence. More importantly, though, was the violation of trust the whole episode represented for Tycho. The ideal of the collaboration of learned and scholarly men searching to understand the nature of God through an examination of the heavens was the one thing Tycho believed in more than anything else. Everything he had done in his professional life rested on that. And I don't think it's going too far to say that in light of other events we'll discuss shortly, it may have been the one thing still sacred to him. The episode with Bear, and possibly his kinsman Lang, who may have stood up for the member of his retinue, was as corrosive a thing as could have happened to Tycho. And I think corrosive here is about the best word we can use, because it's not something that manifests itself immediately. It's sort of a drip, drip, drip of a water faucet kind of a thing that wore at him. Now adding to this were probably a number of factors. First, by the time of the book's publication, Tycho was 41 in a world where living past 40 wasn't much of a given by any stretch of the imagination. It seems pretty clear that not long after this, one can detect the beginning of a long, slow decline in Brahe's energy level probably associated with, as we know today, a decline in testosterone in men at about that age. Adding to this was a fairly brutal observing schedule intermixed with continuing trips to court and entertaining guests. Tycho likely lived a life not unlike a touring rock and roll musician of today, with a lot of late nights, too much alcohol and rich food, not enough sleep, and the wear and tear that goes with that kind of travel. It was a grind that wore him down and made him vulnerable to his darker impulses. Even as his grand project continued to produce mountains of data, he became more secretive and more controlling. 
his idea of being the paterfamilias of the observatory's extended family started looking less and less like a benevolent father and more and more like that Roman patriarch with all of his capriciousness. The things and people who supported his enterprises, the villagers of Venn, the tenants on his other properties, the keeps and churches under his oversight, moved further to the periphery of his thought and became both more neglected and exploited to an even greater degree. This would be the thing that, in due time, would bring Tycho down in Denmark. Now, in a time of difficulty, you might think that a man who was certainly as spiritual as Tycho was would turn to the church. The problem here was that Tycho didn't have a church to turn to by this point. One of the changes that was brewing in Denmark was a move towards a greater level of religious orthodoxy practiced in the Protestant church there. One of the ways this manifested itself had to do with marriages. Now I could talk about what I think the reasons behind this were, but I'd be placing myself in the role of a historian, something I'm most decidedly not. Suffice it to say that in 1580, the religious authorities came out against the very type of common law marriage Tycho was in. Of course, it was after the fact. Eight years after it had approved the union, the Protestant church in Denmark passed an ordinance condemning such unions as a, quote, an evil, scandalous life with mistresses and loose women whom men kept in their houses and with whom they openly associated brazenly and completely without shame, just as if they were good wives, end quote. Now try to put yourself in Tycho's shoes. He's married a pastor's daughter, a fine, upstanding, reputable woman who just happened to be saddled with the flaw that she had not been born to an aristocratic family. He had done right by her, taken care of her, supported her and her children, and gave her a place in his home and his heart. When I put myself in Tycho's shoes, I find myself getting pretty hot about the whole thing, to be honest. So what does he do? Well, in a culture where the religious faith is woven so deeply into the fabric of everything, there's only so much you can do. The first thing he did was stop taking communion which many of my more religious listeners will understand as a huge step away from the church. Over time, he would just neglect the churches under his care, diverting the funds that were supposed to go to their upkeep to observatory projects. It's hard not to see Tycho in this long-term lack of oversight sort of saying, quote, the heavens are my religion now and the observatory my cathedral, end quote. In 1582, this was reinforced by a royal decree, thus reinforcing another burr under Tycho's saddle. You see, as a young man, he'd been okay with that arrangement that his wife and children would remain commoners even as he married. However, once Kirsten and the family moved to the island, every aristocratic visit meant they had to make themselves scarce, as it were. There was to be no mixing or interaction between these two classes. Sooner or later, it had to rub Tycho the wrong way that his wife could not be welcome in her own home. When traveling to court, he understood how the rules might apply, but in the place she carried the keys to, I don't know, to be treated as a second, or actually, once the university assistants were factored in, a third-class person, that didn't sit very well with Tycho. In 1584, Tycho hit upon an idea and with his old preceptor and close friend, Anders Videl, drafted a patent that would make Uraniborg sort of a possession of his families in perpetuity. When Tycho died, the observatory would be kept running under the supervision of one of his male heirs as a fife devoted to scientific work. In creating this royal patent, they were asserting that Van and Uraniborg had more in common with the university than it did with a traditional landed estate something that we would probably think of as being pretty common today. King Frederick agreed and approved it verbally with the Queen as his witness. Unfortunately, the King was not a well man, and in 1588 he died leaving the throne to his 10-year-old son under the oversight of a regency filled with Brahe's relatives and allies. And they too approved this plan, and so it was that it seemed that Uraniborg's future was settled for the long term. One other thing about Brahe that should be noted was that his ability to build bridges across the class and national divides of Europe was absolutely legendary. As much as any figure of the period, 
he sought out and rewarded merit over birthright as a matter of course. Whether it was the hiring of Steenwinkel to be the master architect and builder of Uraniborg, or the selection of a commoner by the name of Lango Montanas to be the assistant at the observatory, he was more interested in talent than he was in heritage. This is not to say that he didn't cultivate relationships with people from all levels of society, as his friendships with Frederick of Denmark and Wilhelm of Hesse show, but rather that for Tycho, relationships were built on respect and the authority that came from scholarship. He scorned most of the aristocracy of Denmark, not because they were born to their position, but rather because they had done little to advance humankind's knowledge with their privilege and status. To be clear here, Tycho was an aristocrat. He had been born and bred into that life of privilege, and everything that he had, and everything he had been able to get away with because of it, was due to that privilege. However, as his fame and respect grew throughout Europe, he began to see himself as being part of a greater and more prestigious noble class, that of the great philosophers of the Western tradition. In this, he began to see himself as being greater than the aristocracy he had come from, and with this came an arrogance towards them, especially the young son of his longtime benefactor. To Tycho, the apple had fallen a bit further from the tree than he had hoped. While Frederick had been a strong king in the old warrior tradition, he had also been a learned man who understood the value of scholarship, the worth of good craftsmen, and pleasure wrought by fine art. His son, Christian, was something of a throwback, embracing the more martial values of the Danish aristocracy while also finding scholarship a thing done by commoners. This would set the two at odds when Christian came of age and assumed the throne in his own right. Things seem to have started to go south beginning in 1590 with a series of incidents showing an increasingly paranoid and brutal Brahe. He imprisoned his tailor for three days. Then a jester in his employ had to flee the island under the cover of darkness. Finally he got into a prolonged dispute with a tenant on one of his properties who he had arrested and imprisoned as well. It's hard to understand why these events seem to begin at this time. It could be that there were earlier instances that were less severe that escaped noticed. There was an incident that reveals some of this likely had to do with a slowly deteriorating sense of trust Tycho had with outsiders to his family. While the aforementioned Longo Montanus had found a warm welcome and a secure place at the observatory, he had come from the University of Copenhagen and, having been from a poor family, was willing to start in a fairly low position and win Tycho's trust, slowly working his way up the ladder. Another student, on the other hand, Frobenius, had a very different experience where he was accepted only provisionally and remained an outsider for much of his time at the observatory. When he was offered an assistantship at the observatory, the terms were so draconian that he had no option but to refuse. After this, though, Fabrinius found that Tycho was unwilling to allow him to leave the island because Tycho probably was afraid he would take everything he had learned there to some other place and uh, sell that information or something. Thus, Fabrinius had to resort to subterfuge to get away from the island, leaving most of his traveling possessions with Tycho there. I imagine when this story started to spread, a number of Tycho's friends began to wonder if something that had been was seriously amiss. It was roughly at this same time that Tycho and Wilhelm began a correspondence over finding an animal for what amounted to the Landgrave Zoo. In the exchange of letters, Tycho dropped hints that he was unhappy on the island. One suspects that the increasing social isolation, not just on his part, but also of his family, was beginning to eat away at his happiness. However, there was also the matter that as he began to review his previous work on atmospheric refraction, he began to find mistakes in its calculation. When the corrections were made and then applied, he found that the previous observation of Mars daily parallax data from 1585 was an error, and that Mars did not actually show 
the parallax that he thought it had. And this had to be a crushing blow. Unfortunately, the Martian oppositions of 1591 and 1593 took place in the summer, and due to the high latitude of Venn, the nights were too short to be able to make new position observations far enough apart in time to be able to measure parallax, had it actually been possible. Added to this were a slew of family problems. The first of these were his sister Sophie falling in love with Eric Lang, the person that had brought Bear back to the island way back in 1584. In 1590 the two were betrothed. The problem was is that Lang was enthralled with a branch of mystical alchemy that tried to turn base metals into precious ones. The old lead into gold thing. He wasted just gobs of his own money chasing phantoms and when he wed Sophie his problem became first hers and then Tycho's. In 1592, he had to smuggle Lang out of the country and away from his creditors, something that certainly didn't help Tycho's popularity and left his distraught sister in his care. The killing blows began to come shortly after that. For years, Tycho had neglected to see to the upkeep of the churches under his oversight, and it finally caught up to him. The chapel of the Magi at Rosekild had fallen into such a state of disrepair that its roof had begun leaking badly. The parishioners had pleaded first to Tycho and then to King Christian. While the boy had been enchanted with Tycho during a 1592 visit to Haven, his attitude changed dramatically when he visited the chapel a year later. So outraged was he that he sent a letter to Tycho demanding the astronomer see to his duties as canon. Tycho seems to have actually ignored the letter from the king. Another year went by and Christian sent another letter in which he threatened to withhold the incomes from the estate if Tycho didn't cede to the repairs. Now this one got Brahe's attention, but he replaced the former vaulted roof with a less majestic and beautiful slanted one, thus sliding the wishes of the king. Little did he know he was really now beginning to tread on thin ice. At about the same time, there was a debacle in trying to wed his eldest daughter to the wealthy son of an academic at Copenhagen, who had long been associated with the observatory. In fact, there are indications that Tycho had intended to make this particular young man the director of the observatory upon his retirement, something that wasn't all that too far off. It was a match made, it seemed, with the blessing of the heavens. While things got off to a good start in making the arrangements, they quickly turned sour as Tycho's demand for a wedding befitting a nobleman's daughter quickly outstripped the groom's ability to pay for it. Before long, the young man got cold feet and he withdrew his proposal, costing Tycho an enormous amount of prestige. This was made worse by the young man spreading malicious rumors about the Brahe family in general and the daughter in particular. By 1595, Tycho was overhearing ribald stories about him and his daughter told in taverns and at court. He had no choice but to sue to regain his family honor, as he was too old for a duel, and the last time he had gone that route, it had gone rather poorly for him. In 1596, Tycho attended the coronation of Christian IV, and the boy king he had treated lightly was now his liege lord. Tycho had every reason to expect that the young man would respect the decisions of his father. In this, he could not have been more mistaken. The project of Haven was costing the crown about 1% of its total budget. That may not seem like much, but it amounts to about a ton of gold, literally one ton of gold, over the 20-year period the observatory was funded. In other words, it was a huge investment of resources. One Christian wasn't committed to continuing, especially as it was run by a guy he wasn't exactly happy with. There was also a bigger thing going on here than just a fit of pique with one of his elder aristocrats. Christian had a very different view of his monarchy than his father had had. Frederick understood that he was king because his family had been supported by all of the other families who might have had a claim to the throne. While he was more than first among equals, he understood that the relationship between him and his aristocrats was a two-way street. Christian, on the other hand, saw being the king in a much more autocratic way. In his mind, he ruled by divine right, and any of the old guard who couldn't get on board with that would be moved out of the halls of power. That included the Brahes, the Billes, and the Oxes. Soon Christian began transferring estates from these families to men he would felt would better use the incomes to defend the kingdom. 
This included Tycho, who had an estate stripped from him, one whose income helped support the work on Venn. As you might imagine, Tycho protested this. But when he did so, he did it in an imperious tone that further soured the relationship. In January of 1597, the king responded that he would not permanently fund Uraniborg and that Tycho, if he wished to continue the project, would have to make do on restricted resources. He then informed Tycho that he would end the royal subsidy in March. All of this was too much for Tycho, who felt he had served his kingdom faithfully and to the best of his ability. He sent out feelers to the other places in Europe who might take him if he left, and the responses he received sealed his decision. That winter, he decided to leave Venn and return to his home in Copenhagen where he had lots of friends at the university. But as soon as he arrived there, he found himself embroiled in a number of continuing controversies. The first was that there were a number of faculty at the university that weren't exactly to have a scientific rival and a rival scientific institution being set up right in the town that would compete for scholars and students. While Tycho's income was diminished, he still had more money than those working at the academy and so he could afford to pay more. The second issue was that there was a religious fight brewing between two factions of the Lutheran faith. One that tended to follow the ideas of Philip Melechthon and another which claimed to go back to the purer ideas of Martin Luther. The second group had the upper hand in the debate and used their power to enforce a certain level of orthodoxy that alienated and marginalized the Philippists. Given that Melechthon's ideas on liberal arts education had shaped Tycho's ideas about the best way to live, he was among those who came out on the short end. Finally, and this was the straw that broke the camel's back, the villagers on Haven once again filed suit against Tycho. While they didn't have much of a case, Tycho's enemies stirred up a crowd who then rioted in front of his home, threatening his family. With a couple of invitations from various German noblemen in hand, Tycho decided that discretion was the better part of valor, and he fled the city, never more to return. His last project, overseen by Longo Montanus, had been to get his star catalog up to 1,000 entries, and now that that was approaching completion, he could make a clean break with Denmark and start over somewhere else. As the long caravan snaked past the Vordenborg Castle, the place where Tycho had spent much of his childhood, there must have been a great sadness that hung over the family. The first stop was Rostock, and it was here, in the midst of an academic town, bustling with activity and away from the intrigues of Copenhagen, that Tycho seemed to find some of the old energy. He was received warmly and with respect, and for the first time in over 15 years, he and his wife could take communion together in the city's church, St. Mary's. It was a tonic for both his wounded heart and neglected soul, and it restored some of his faith, both in God and in his fellow man. It was also a place where he could finalize his plans of where to go next without having to worry about having his house burned down around his ears. The initial goal was to try to get back to Denmark and restore his name, but he knew that he'd need an intermediate plan. In service to his first goal, he again wrote to Christian, but again, his sense of decorum seems to have been lost. Rather than adopting a conciliatory tone that might have smoothed things over, he wrote as the young man's equal and threatened to take his talents elsewhere if an arrangement couldn't be reached. Not surprisingly, when the response finally did come, basically said, don't let the door hit you on the way out. But that response would be a while in coming. While he waited, Tycho continued to take the temperature of the waters at other courts and was assured by Duke Ulrich at Mecklenburg that his exile wouldn't be for long. Ulrich was Christian's grandfather and he promised Tycho that he would work to intercede on the astronomer's behalf with his grandson. In time, Tycho once again set out from Rostock and traveled to Schleswig Holstein to seek the counsel of the viceroy there, Heinrich Rensau. Rensau offered Tycho a castle for his use while he waited for word from Christian, 
It was here that Tycho would receive the letter that ended all chance of him returning to Copenhagen. The castle was fairly well suited for use to make astronomical observations, and that's what Tycho did while he worked to find some other patronage. His primary target was the Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II in Prague. It was a delicate negotiation, but one thing Tycho had in his favor was that back when he had traveled as Frederick's representative around Europe, he had stopped off at the ceremonies that had named Rudolf King of the Romans, a title that placed him next in line to become the emperor. Over the course of the next year, various communications went back and forth. Chief among these was a book Tycho had been working on that detailed his instruments and observational processes and contained his star chart. It was something of an extended resume to be presented to any individual who wished to sponsor his continuing work, most especially Rudolf II. Tycho may have despised court life, but he understood it well, and he had the full complement of schmoozing skills to make his way in aristocratic life. Not only did he send the book, he lined up letters of support and got important individuals at the court in Prague to vouch for him. These were individuals who could maneuver things in just the right ways so that he could get an interview. There was, however, one fly in the ointment. While in Schleswig-Holstein, Tycho received two books, one written by the new imperial mathematician to the court on Prague, a man going by the name of Ursus, the Latinized name of Bear. In the book, Bear, the man who had been snooping around in Tycho's library, admitted to stealing Tycho's idea, and then went on to cast specifically terrible aspersions on Tycho's family. While Tycho as a nobleman could never accept a position in court, it was clear that it would have to deal with Ursus when he got to Prague. Also disturbing was a foreword to the book written by a fairly unknown German mathematician by the name of Johannes Kepler, who praised Ursus's work far above and beyond its value. When Tycho got over his frustration with the first book, he got around to looking the second one he had received over. Surprisingly, it was by the self-same Kepler, and it was a work of some real quality, unlike the very derivative work of Ursus. Tycho was intrigued and recognized that the foreword to Ursus's book may very well have been an attempt by the young Kepler to ingratiate himself with an older and more powerful colleague. Nevertheless, in due time, the invitation to visit the court in Prague was extended and accepted, and with some delicate and mind-bogglingly elaborate negotiations, Tycho met Rudolf in March of 1599. During this time, Tycho learned that Ursus had very much fallen out of favor at court and so gathered all the resources he could to make a case that the man was a scoundrel who had gone out of his way to sully Tycho's name and besmirch his honor. By the time Tycho arrived, Ursus had slipped out of Prague to avoid the inevitable summons to court to be held accountable for his actions. On a more positive note, at the audience, Rudolf promised his patronage for Tycho and a place for he and his assistants to work. By August of that year, Tycho had selected and begun moving into the castle Benatki, perched on a bluff above the river Jezirao. Tycho would work there at Benatki for a little over a year, and it would be during this time that he'd bring Kepler onto his staff as an assistant. As we'll discuss their relationship in more detail in a future episode, let me be brief. The two men struggled to get along and had a number of falling outs. However, they managed to patch their relationship together, and Kepler was able to work on and off for Tycho for the rest of his life. This, however, was somewhat secondary to the issues Tycho was having getting the mansion at Benetki to a better state for observatory, and getting the funding that Rudolf had promised. It seems that the emperor had a habit of making grand financial gestures that he couldn't keep, and this one to Tycho was really no different. The other problem was that like a number of enlightened despots of the age, Rudolf liked to keep people close to him. As such, by the summer of 1600, after a wave of the plague had swept through and cleared out of Prague, Tycho was sucked back into court, more or less against his desires, in his role as the emperor's astrologer and then one of his closest advisors. And so it was, on the night of October 13th, 
that Tycho attended the banquet that led to the circumstances that resulted in his death. In the last several years, there have been a number of alternate theories that have been put forward to explain Tycho's passing. The reason for this is that modern physicians find it hard to believe that a man could hold his urine to the point where his bladder would rupture. The most common alternative put forward is that Tycho was killed by mercury poisoning, resulting from his work in alchemy. Others have suggested he was poisoned by Kepler who sought to obtain all the all of Tycho's data, or by an agent of Christian IV seeking a bit of revenge. One scholar I've read suggests that Tycho, tired of all the court intrigue and knowing that he could never escape Rudolph, committed suicide by mercury poisoning. None of these hypotheses were supported by the evidence acquired when Tycho's body was exhumed in 2010, and so the account by Kepler of the circumstances of Tycho's death is still hailed to be the most likely explanation. And so we come to the end of the life of Tycho Brahe, and he will now pass from our narrative, exit the stage as it were. His data, on the other hand, will still loom large as we take up our story with the work of Johannes Kepler in our next episode. As I close, let me once again express my gratitude to Dr. Tony Christie for his help in getting my questions about Tycho's observational work answered. For those who are interested in this kind of thing, this history of astronomy stuff, I really recommend his blog, Renaissance Mathematicus, as an excellent resource to sort of get below the typical stories to see what was really going on. Also, for those of you who are listening who are huge Tycho buffs, you know that I've glossed over or left out a number of items from his biography. I apologize that for that, but it was done in the interest of time. Were I to have included everything that I learned, this series would have run five or six or seven episodes long. For those who have a deeper curiosity about the man and his life, I encourage you to consult the references I've listed over the last few episodes. For me personally, this foray into the life of someone I had always heard about but hardly knew has been enormously rewarding, and I hope that I've been able to pass on at least a little bit of that excitement in this too brief accounting of his life. As always, thanks for listening. If you haven't done so, please be sure to subscribe to the show on whatever service you use to listen to podcasts so that you never miss an episode. Also, if you have some time, leave us a strong review at wherever you're at. It helps us to get more listeners. Finally, be sure to check out the work of the Blue Dot Sessions at their website, sessions.blue. Until next time... Full sails on your journey.